Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Artie. How are you today? Hi, Michael. I'm doing well. Great. How about you? Thank you for asking. I'm doing really well. My wife and I just came back from a two hour course that we went to. Um, and it was it was all about the science of life. And oh it's it's going to run. It's like we're going to go there every month for two years, Artie. So, yeah, we feel really motivated <laughs> by you what we discussed. You know, we'll look this up when we're done with our call. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the title. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll, I'll have to share it with you. It's, it's a little bit unusual. I'll t- I'll tell, if we have time, I'll tell you a bit more about it. But mm-hmm. it's not about me. It's about you today, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Well, that's your story for today. We learned that you had a great experience, but yeah. yeah, we did, we did, we did. So, Artie, I I normally start with one really open question, and that is, uh, Artie, please share with us your story and how you got to where you are today. Well, Michael, first of all, I want to start by acknowledging a gratitude for you having me on your show and also for what your interface is about. I think storytelling is such a beautiful art form. That's mm-hmm. how we got history. That's how we, that's how we interface with our children, with our families, with our communities is stories. And stories You're right. Us. So thank you for having an interface of just storytelling because most podcasts have you know, it, I just love the fact that that's your interface. Thank so. you. Yeah, me too. I love it too. <laughs> I hope so, because it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> so where do we start? Let's do the beginning of time, the beginning of time. Um, I, I grew up uh, in Northern Virginia, which is not too far from DC, probably 45 minutes. Well, no longer because of traffic, but back in those days. Um, yeah. I grew up to immigrant uh parents my my dad actually uh was studying here because my grandfather on my dad's side was um he worked for the u.s embassy i mean he worked for the indian embassy and they had a um, consulate program with the u.s embassy so he traveled here he had traveled to um saigon traveled to london he was really all over in terms of international travel so my dad actually went to high school here uh did college and he was an engineer by trade and then in those days um and especially even now um he actually had an arranged marriage but he got to meet my mom uh when he went over got to meet and in some traditional Indian families you don't actually get to meet the person you're married until the day that you're married uh that did not happen for my parents they actually had some time to 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 meet each other and arrangement just means like to be honest with you Michael arrangement is, is kind of like when we have friends it's like we have a friend who's single and somebody else it's just um in in that definition my parents really my grandparents kind of knew of each other my mom's dad was a, a a police officer pretty far up in the the um the Indian government and so they knew of each other because of their job status, to be honest with you. And so yeah. um, in that regard, uh, you know, I think I think that idea of, of Indian culture and, and, and it always actually helps me to realize that we need to not be so fixated. I got fixated on even how I met my husband, <laughs> like um, not to become fixated on how we meet our life partner because Um, And I'll get into that in a minute. My my mom and dad didn't get a chance to have a long marriage. My dad passed when I was 12. So my mom and dad were actually married 14 years. But I can tell you that that the way that I know that he loved my mother and the way that she knew he loved him was how well he planned in his short 41 years of his life. Like just the idea of, of, of really planning well and things that a, a normal 30 and 40 year old wouldn't think about, like having mm. a life insurance in place, um, really thinking about, um, you know, trying really hard to work so hard to make sure that the house was in a good position. 
And, you know, Mike, a lot of my work that I do is in advocacy around the story that my mom, my, my dad in building good legacy, then my mom who learned from his example when her, on her passing, and I'll get into all that, but in her passing created strong legacy. So now I want to carry that forward for my own family, but also the work that I do now is all about legacy and paying it forward mm. so that we, you know, we create these systematic things in place um, and it's possible. And I literally just got off a call talking about the idea of, pre of, of really planning well. Um, and so back to, back to the, 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 they got married, they had me lived in Northern Virginia. Um, so I grew up in the suburbs of, of Virginia, um, was surrounded by just community you know you really really my grandparents um were were close by and my my uncles and my aunts were close and then of course just family friends become um become part of that and I remember always getting the ability to play outside which I so always want kids to be able to do now I know um, so I just remember uh my mom would ask me to come by dusk. And like, when I got, when I came home late one day, I got in massive trouble, but thank God my grandparents from India were visiting. Cause they were like, just lay off of just, they, they were like, it's okay. It's okay. Forgive her. It'll be okay. But I just remember those days of being playing outside and having so much fun with the neighborhood kids and kind of like the idea of, of youth and fun. And, and then, like I shared with you, my, my dad actually, um, yeah, he did pass early because uh, he had a rare uh, autoimmune disease and he actually was a case study here at NIH, which is the National Institutes of Health. But he didn't actually, we found out later, he didn't, uh, that wasn't his cause of death, um, but he would have eventually had a shorter lifespan because it basically is a disease that is attacking your immune system. And so I just remember a lot of visits in and out of the hospital because he would have to have constant surgeries. Um, you know, and that kind of shaped a lot of, a lot of what, again, of what is happening now in my own, yes. my own career path and my life path. Um, so remember that a lot. And then it was, I don't have any siblings. So it was just my mom and me. And uh, I will tell you, Michael, those years were a little challenging because of the fact that we lost a lot of, we lost, you know, when, when someone passes, not only is it the loss of that life, but a lot of the life and people talk about the lot of, lot of loss or changes in relationships. So we witnessed that as well. And so we had built a lot of great, great relationships, which I'm so thankful for because they're a big driving force in my life now. But there was also these changes that were occurring. I was going into my teenage years trying to figure out and process. Of course, that's always a hurdle, those adolescent years. Um, and yeah. so, um, you know, and I didn't realize I was, I was also grieving in a really crazy way that was not always the healthiest way, I think. You know, I spent, I think I always carry with me that people at, tell you not to cry or be sad. And as a child, you take that on you. And those messages stay forever. So I think I just, you know, like most of us shoved it inside, bottled yeah. up. Um, but my mom and I became very, very close. And, and I was just so grateful that, that we were always, I, I was always very close to my parents. But the idea that I really um, was so grateful for, for um, the time with her. Um, and then... I just knew I always loved kids. I still have my journal and, and, and this journal that I, we had done in fifth grade. And I had at that time written that I wanted to be a pediatrician, but through the years I realized I went uh, to undergrad first year sitting in this bio class and I'm like, wait a minute, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if <laughs> I really want to do this. <laughs> Medical school's cut out for me. And that one class was enough for me to just take a different trajectory. And I always loved my psychology class from, under, from I'm sorry, high school. It was so, it was just so fascinating. I loved human behavior. Why do people do what they do? Yes. Brain. Like I've always been fascinated. Mm. Way, before, way before Michael, everybody and their mother loves mental health and psychology. This is like so yes. many years ago. 
And so I pursued a degree in um, psychology and, um, and I also got to do a minor in international studies and peace and conflict resolution. And that was a really, really great program to, to those conflict skills and learning all of that become so critical. So those two, the, the, they both connected really well. Yeah. Psych psychology, you know. Um, and then I went on to actually uh, wanted to see if I wanted to pursue education and in, in terms of teaching. So I became a kindergarten assistant and all through college, I worked in early childhood preschool settings because um, it was really great for the schedule, love kids. Um, and it was really a, a really great experience. Went on and I decided at that point, if I really love this kindergarten assistantship, then I would go to grad school for education. And so I yeah. did that really enjoy it and so I went and then I taught for seven years in the elementary ed setting wow yeah but in the meantime I was getting a little itchy because the kids I was always fixed more on the behavior always fascinated by that behavior see these themes keep coming up of certain themes and I'm fascinated by the behavior and also I was known as a softy and so sometimes the kids who were considered sensitive or a little bit of a, you know, emotional challenge, whatever you want to call them, whatever it is. Yeah. Maybe come to my classroom because I am the big softy. And so, <laughs> so um, and those years, then what happened was I was so fast. I was like, I really want to go into mental health counseling. So then I, I was pursuing a clinical health degree, clinical mental health. And Michael, those years did really, really impact my teaching. I became so hyper aware of how to teach better. And I mean by teaching better, like teaching in all of our multiple intelligence ways, like Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory, if anyone ever wants to look it up, is so awesome because we all learn in different ways. It's not just visual or auditory. We have musical, spatial, like, excuse me, all of these mathematical, logical, um, artistic, all of these components that were missing sometimes. And so I started to realize how to engage better with the kids and also to check emotionally, like that emotional radar, always being in check of like, half the time these kids are hungry, right? And then we don't even realize. So always going to that root is what my program really helped us to do. And I became a yes. better listener, honestly. Um, and then I worked in a bunch of different settings, uh, and I, I loved all of them, honestly. I worked in transitional housing with some, that was my internship with, with women. Um, and then I worked um, in private practice and got to work with children and families and had great supervisors. And then um, I was in a supervisor role where I was able to help um, school-based staff to, to provide services, love doing that. Um, and, and, you know, and that part has been career wise, that part has been so exciting, had been exciting. Yes. Um, and then career wise, I always had thought of myself staying home with my kids if I ever had the opportunity. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. My husband's in there somewhere in this story. Here. Yes. Then <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, then my. Um, if I had the opportunity, I did want to stay at home for a few years. And, you know, I always say, if you put out your intentions to the universe, or you really put them out there, or you think them, if you really believe in them or give them a little bit of like positivity, back to positive psychology, a lot of times, some shape or form, they do end up happening. So I had the good fortune and my husband was very supportive. I did stay home. Um, with my children while I was still doing webinars and seminars and still staying active in the field, just not working clinically all the time of those, those hours. I was working 10 to 15 hours um, seeing clients and then doing some webinars, but not full time. And I'm so grateful because those years, I do think shaped the relationship with me and my children and also my mom. My mom was a big yes. part of helping raise our children because my husband was traveling a lot for work. And so our I just know that if, if I can honestly say, if people have the choice, it's so powerful to have those, 
to zero to two or three, if you can make it to three, and then if they're ready for that school environment. If you can give even half time, I really am seeing the impact because I see it in my own family and my own children that that impact made. Um, and it's not because I'm a teacher, Michael. I just know that I just read to them all the time. I took them to library classes. I, you know, I cultivated friendships with other moms who then had children the same age. So there was a lot that got to happen. And I feel like I'm so grateful for that experience. I know moms are so strapped now, the working moms who are trying to make it so that they can have their child have these experiences. Yes. But then they're either in the daycare setting and or they're somebody else is raising them, but they feel like they could, you know, there's just so much discord. And so in part of my story, I, I'm very grateful. And I do not take it lightly that I was given the gift of being able to do that. Um, do you sure. think just, a, just a quick question on that. I mean, do you think society, you know, like capitalist society still hasn't really got to grips with that, that, nurturing that needs to happen by working mothers and you know allow working mothers to do that nurturing for the no, you know for longer than people are suggesting it should happen today michael 100 percent, 100 percent. and use the word capitalist and it is it's like yes yes because you know, we do thrive on productivity and money making and all of this business, but it hasn't highlighted the fact that everything in life is relational, yeah. you know, and money's energy and having this relational piece. And I can honestly tell you that that is a hundred percent. Your the answer to your question is yes. Um, mm. That we, we have foregone looking at the relational component on uh, supporting a working mother so that, she gets to, and, and honestly, Michael, some people like I knew that that was something I wanted. A lot of times, a lot of moms are not given choice, but some of them are on the margin where if yeah. they had a family discussion, they could have really decide what it is for themselves. So that's why I, I highlight this because it is something that I always, when I work with parents and families, I always that help them to evaluate is it something that they actually want or they can they cut costs somewhere to make what they want to make work you know mm. um because because oftentimes a lot of people are not leading their almost authentic life right we all uh, it's taken me a while to get here as well to live my yeah. authentic life but we're kind of following the joneses or we're you know we literally are thinking we want the material wealth yes when in solidarity we actually question it and then we're like wait that's actually not what i really want well we're conditioned aren't we this oh. is what happens we're so conditioned so we don't even know that we're going down that route mm -hmm. and you know because of that conditioning it means we've got to continue working we've got to continue earning we got to continue getting all the things that we need we need to continue showing we're on nice vacations you know because the others are doing it and then we want children on top of that then they suffer I'm sorry to use the word suffer but I'm kind of they suffer in some way mm -hmm. and that going around the whole piece that you were saying about mental health then that mental health issue with the kids shows up in school and in work in later life. And you kind of go, whoa, we've got a massive mental health problem. We need to prevent it. Well, we're not looking at the, you know, the cause in the first place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and everything's about relationships. In my opinion, relationships and communication are key. Yes. I feel like that is something that I realize are huge. And so if we don't have those two in place, you know, um, and that has become a lot big part of my story is realizing that everything is relational, like my relationships, personally and professionally, I, re I realized without, without connectivity, what do we really have? You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Career-wise, yes, I, I, I know I fixated a little bit on that 
concept of being at home, but I just want to take a minute. I also want to help that I concept of the stay at home mom. I actually did a seminar on this, a workshop, because I didn't want stay at home moms to feel like they weren't working. There was this this quote that said, if you actually were supposed to be earning, it would be a minimum of $150,000 because of the time and the literally everything that is involved with that role as well. And so I, I am hugely passionate about the fact that we need to take away the stigma of like stay at home moms not working because taking care of our children, like what you just said, that is a beautiful gift of work and it's a labor of love and it should be acknowledged too. And capitalist society, yes, does say that money is the way that we show value. Yeah. Well, hello, actually relationships and healthy functioning individuals show value, which comes through like where, where you're saying all the way starting from newborn then then leads to that healthy sense of self that then leads and carries forth. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I look at resiliency, um, Michael, uh, a lot. And resiliency, in my opinion, doesn't come from it. They're, they haven't done studies on resiliency and money. Like it doesn't, it doesn't go right. No, we all need a certain amount to, to have our needs met. And Interesting fact, the average after there, I took a class on this. She's a professor at Yale and she does, her name is, I just forgot it. Uh, yeah, Lori Santos. She does work on positive psychology. As you can tell, I get talk about psychology all the time because I'm so passionate about it. But <laughs> yeah. after 75,000, don't quote me, it might've changed, but $75,000, your level of satisfaction in life is not increasing. No. So if you have more than that, it doesn't, it's not, they have done studies on this which tells you you need enough where you can take that vacation you're talking about or the things that you want to do but you also are saving and you're taking care of your needs and yeah. living you know comfortably mm. um and so i believe i'm always further education so of course here we go i, t- I got the second degree i didn't think i i i, I in my back of my mind i always thought it would be great for me to one day teach at the at the um, university level because I would love to make an impactful change in many settings for myself and just hopefully it works for others. And so, um, you know, you realize their themes. That theme came up in a few years ago. I was like, uh, I had the opportunity to help contribute in our in our book, uh, so I got to contribute a chapter. And so. Uh, Michael, I was really humbled by the experience because in my college writing class, I I like got like it my I got F's on all majority of my papers in college, <laughs> all marked red, <laughs> terrible, you know, like awful. And there's a stereotype that Indian kids are all supposed to get straight A's and do really well in school. Well, here I am to tell anybody who's of age to say, I'm the kid who didn't always do well on tests sometimes. I didn't do well, but but I will always remember that I, yeah, I was like, I, I'm, I'm never going to get good at this writing thing. I'm never going to want to do it. And then fast forward a few years later, somebody's asking me, oh, I was on her podcast she helps um, authors do work on the side. And she said, would you like to contribute? I'm working on this writing. But I was like, wait, what? You're asking yeah. me, have you seen my writing? <laughs> she said, it doesn't matter. When you have a story to tell and you can tell it, I can help along the way. So yeah. I took her up on it because I say yes a lot. I do still say no to a lot of things, but I say yes to a lot more things. Cause I'm like, why not keep your door yeah. right? Keep your mind and heart open. That's one of my favorite just quotes. Keep your mind and heart open. And so, yeah, Michael, after that experience, I even debunked my, I, you know what? I just need to, if I can, if I, someone can believe me enough to let go of that belief, I can't write yes. in my own internal dialogue that came from that experience. Then what's holding me back? So I started researching some PhD programs in psychology, and then I, I literally started uh, in my, my second year and I really, really am learning to, I have to work twice as hard as probably 
anyone else to write a little bit better, but I think we're all reforming our writing. Um, but it reminds me of not shortchanging our dreams because mm. dreams do start in childhood. They start when I'm giving you the story of, yeah, I'm not a pediatrician, but I were, I've loved it working with children and it's in there. I said somewhere down the line that I really wanted to teach at a university level. So guess what? That creation of that story is in the works. I said that I wanted to, to help, you know, I really wanted to help others. And now um, I, I, I found in the story, in my own story, a big part of my story is my relationship with my mom. So my mom in 2019, well, yes, in 2019, she was diagnosed. No, I'm sorry, 2018, she was diagnosed with cancer, stage four ovarian. And so through her journey, I went through researching different treatments, alternative health um, therapies, everything in terms of medical and then nutrition. I mean, you name it, like all of the gamuts, right? Because here you are wanting to help save, save this physical life of somebody. Yes. That you, you do everything. But in that process, I myself was becoming educated. Well, I've been vegetarian for 20 years, but after the, doing the research and then watching a life-changing movie for me personally, it was called Forks Over Knives on Netflix. I then became vegan in the journey while I'm, while she's also making a few changes. I mean, we just, just the idea of juicing every morning and, you know, just trying to really keep keep in those kinds of frameworks and through her cancer journey going into her I was again blessed again that I I was able to have support and helping so we were doing a lot of um, juicing and different things in that natural um, health health realm but just realizing that I was fortunate to be able to be with her at her chemo appointments but so many people who were coming on their own or we realized their stories of being on their own mm. Uh, you know, it's just very, very impactful because these doctors' visits are intense, and so I was able to go to the visits with her. I did help advocate, like I would ask what I would do the research, and so a big part of what I do now is telling all of the clients I work with, especially to bring up age. Some of our older, our our elders do not necessarily believe it's okay to ask questions from your doctor because we have to remember the trajectory of the timeline of when they were in healthcare. The doctor yes. was the we have had a shift where the doctor is the partner in my in my body, right? And so I'm still in the driver's seat, but they're in my passenger. Not like so that shift, and um, and so just grateful for that experience. So my mom had passed in um, uh, uh, August of 2019, and so we had done a lot of the discussions around like how do you want it to look. We pre-planned, she had already planned a lot of things ahead of time, but even got a lot of state of affairs in order. And she was given that privilege of time to do that. But again, had already planned really well, but I got to ask her questions on certain things. And, um, and so after she passes, I already believe in energy medicine for a very long time. I had done a Reiki training years ago and that training, like Reiki, if anyone doesn't know, is it's just the idea of um, energy healing through our hands um, and and really being able to provide uh, light. Um, and I'm not defining it well, but it really is a great mechanism for 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 healing. And so, I was giving myself a self treatment, and in her room, she uh, the Bhagavad Gita is the, is the Hindu text. She had her Bhagavad Gita small copy, and inside of it falls like I'm literally. I just go in there into her room that day, and it's in October of 20, yeah, a few months after she passed, so 2019. And literally, these this paper falls out, and it's these stages of like, like life written, like birth and background. Um, it, childhood marriage uh, marriage and children I mean all, all of these life stages and if any of you have heard of Eric Erickson from psychology he has written out these um, psychosocial life stages it reminded me of life of, of Eric Erickson I was like my mom is so brilliant and 
And I know all these folks who, she, she had her bachelor's, but they always, she always thought I wasn't smart enough. I guess you get this concept that education means smartness, which I don't think by any means, but I think a lot of people evaluate that. Um, yes. I was like, you've always been brilliant to me, but then I see this, I'm like, oh my gosh, here's, and I look at this and oh my goodness, Michael, like literally things are falling to place because, because what energy medicine and healing can do is really help you to build your intuitive, your true intuitive self. So I literally put two and two together. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm getting messages from my mom to set up this nonprofit and organization, which is called the holistic life care. Dia is because my mom, every day of her life would light a joke, um, and every day in the morning. And even though religiously hin is Hindu, I just remember we, I just grew up in a spiritual house. Like you literally use the relationship with God to ground you is how, and that has provided me a lot of comfort in my life. Um, and so the Dia is the logo came from the idea of that idea of light. And so um, the website has my, has my mom's picture and my dad's picture. Cause I literally feel this reunification of them post death. Cause I, I feel like people who really have that true love, you can just feel it. You know what I mean? And I feel like yes. they, have, they had it for each other. Um, and then, uh, and, and the idea of these life stages. So I put something on my website on that, um, because I, I took a photograph of that. Um, and it's like, it's like you've heard of these stories. I never thought I'd be one, but out of loss or out of loss came a rebirth. And so I don't even know if it's a rebirth more than it, it, it's like a, it's like her spirit combined with my spirit took over where I get to live this place of service because now I realize that service is one of the most giving gifts that really fills up your cup. And, um, and so, and then in grad school, we had to make up a name of a, uh, a mock business. And so I called it love and light for kids. But when I looked it up in the business place, like it was already something was too similar. So I changed it a little bit. And I'm talking about this again, about building connections. Cause I literally think themes will come through your life and you don't even realize until yes. you, you know? And so that, so the business focuses on love and life for kids is designed for pri providing parent, child, family support, support for early childhood educators. So a lot of, um, I have a lot of contracts that I do for wherever the need is. And then the holistic life care is coaching through the lifespan. So health coaching, um, helping with, uh, uh, cancer support. And if you notice, I'm bringing up themes that have occurred in my own life or yep. my mom's life or my family's life uh, and uh, pre-planning. And so I have met a lot of great people in the last couple of years, even during the pandemic. Is, um, and one of them is my strategic alliance partner. She has a, it's called Pause for a Moment is her, the name of her company. And she is a funeral director and we both took a death doula class together during the pandemic. There's like 300 people on this call, but there are a few that you always connect with and we just connected. And so she, she and I both are in this desire to help uh, really debunk the myths of planning early, helping get our states of affair in order, um, you know, and building legacy because that's really important in her work because she's always looking at life backwards because that's what she does for a living in the funeral industry. And I bring that place because I have seen what good planning can do Yeah. in, in the comfort that it can provide your family when there's grieving going on. And Michael, everybody has something to leave behind. It's not about the, it's not about monetary assets. It's the fact that it's, Everything that we work so hard to build for, if we don't put it in place and have a plan, then what are we doing? Yeah. Um, and then I didn't share, of course, my, my husband, I'm, I, uh, I, I'm so grateful to him because he lets me do all the 10 million crazy things that I do, even though he thinks I'm not. <laughs> but um, uh, we've been married now 11 years. 
and we have two daughters and I'm so grateful because while I'm doing the crazy things in life, they provide me such grounding and, and joy. Even I find joy in doing all the work that I'm fortunate to do. They provide that grounding of just good old fashioned family fun. The fun that I grew up with that I ch so cherish. Um, uh, and, and so I've learned to live a lot of, um, my mom had this phrase of um, enjoy your time. She said it a lot, especially, uh, especially during those terminal days, but she always said it around, enjoy your time. And I started to process, she's saying each moment is a gift as hard as it can be. It is so challenging at times, but find a way. And so every time I get to a place, right, you know, the daily hustle and bustle gets to all of us. I try to remember her voice and what she meant through all of her trials and tribulations. Like, what can we learn from those messages that are, that when those that we love who are no longer with us are always imparting their wisdom on how can we take them? And so I, uh, I try to make sure I incorporate that. Fabulous. Wow. <laughs> Well done to you. And also just to say sorry for your loss uh, with your mom and also your dad at a very young age. And it's it's a fascinating listening to how things evolved. It was, was just beautiful to witness how your trajectory or your journey you know, moved into different directions. And you told it very, very well. And you could just visualize how certain life events made you very subtly change direction into, you know, where you are literally, where you got to today, <laughs> uh, as I said in my first question. And um, with, I suppose... It's not just that there's two pieces. If I'm, if I, I'm testing myself if I've got it right, but I see as there's two parts now with the partner that you're working with as well is there is the kind of living part and how to get most out of life. But then there is also the planning part and what happens when energetically you're no longer here in a physical body. And that actually, we don't spend enough time on that second piece, for sure, because we take things for granted. We don't want to look at that because that's bad news, you know. And the trouble is, people that are left behind picking up the pieces. I mean, my aunt lost, um, oh, just to mention, um, you, you'll like this. My mother was Indian and my father was Dutch. Mm. Um, and my uncle, uh, I only ever ha had one uncle. My father was only son and my mother had a, a younger sister and a younger brother. And uh, the younger sister died quite young, uh, lung cancer. My mum died quite young um, because of her heart conditions, both People died young because of smoking related illnesses. My uncle died not so young, but still relatively young, 81. Mm -hmm. He died this month last year. And I was emailing back and forth with my aunt who's in France. And she said, this is now a year on. She's saying, I'm still dealing with paperwork right now. You know, so the death of her husband is still raw. She's still grieving, you know, a year on, and she's still having to deal with all the paperwork and the legal side of it. And although they did a lot of planning, I'm sure they did, but maybe they didn't quite do enough, you know, to not have to be bothered with all of that nonsense. So it's really, really important. I don't think people pay enough atten attention to it. And as you said, it's not just the financial piece and the paperwork bit. It's the energetic. It's the, you know, what's left of that person's life. You know, I think you mentioned legacy early on, too. So 
so have I got that right? So you're dealing with the living piece and the and the passing piece, right? Um, you're hundred percent. I I didn't and I do a lot of work with grief and loss, loss. Um, so when you're talking about your I was just thinking about your aunt, you know, she's processing and, you know, a year later anniversary grief hits you hard. Like you don't realize what's happening. There's a lot of stuff that happens even years after someone's passed, you'll feel things in your body because we do lodge, we do lodge things in our body. And yes. so, um, and so, yes, yeah, sometimes when we're dealing with, and you're right, there's always, there is some pieces to pick up after someone's passed. Um, I also, right, but not to the degree where it can be a mess and a half, where you can't actually process and 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 look at how your heart is hurting and your mind yeah. and your spirit are hurting, you know. Mm. Mm. Um, and honestly, uh, you know, uh, Michael, I myself share my story openly. Like I, I remember I would think it was the fourth month after my mom passed I told my husband I'm like I have to go to the hospital like I literally felt achy and hurt and like I was going through and do you know what it was later on that that the so uh we had a for a year we were given through the bereavement through the hospice they they checked on me so the social worker said I think you were suffering from a broken heart but I literally thought something was wrong with me my heart was yeah broken. I was like just achy and tired and nobody tells you the fact that you're gonna have physical symptoms too of manifesting loss in your body and so a lot of my passion has come through you know what I don't want anyone to have to deal the same way with losing someone of not being able to process you know yeah 100 yeah I mean the thing is it's an it's a you know when when I lost my dad I was 25 mm -hmm. and that was the first bit of grief that I experienced mm -hmm. and I was quite I'd gone into workplace employment for a, quite a young age so I've been very busy working and that was my focus and you know and there were lots of changes happening at work and I was very stressed by it and people being made redundant and I didn't cope very well with that and then was actually I worked for an American company and I remember the guy that came over from the USA and he turned around to me and said, you know, change at work. If you have a lot of change at work, the way you've got to look at it is you have an interesting job. When you lose a family member, that's real change, you know, because, and I never knew what he meant because I hadn't lost a family member that by then. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to 25, I lost a family member. And then I went, now I know what he means. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's totally different. You know, all the kind of stresses and change that happens with work and everything is okay. It's, it's, you know, we can deal with it. I mean, we, we often say we can't, we make a big deal of it, but actually it's just an interesting job. <laughs> losing a family member that's real change so i've i've never forgotten that and so it allows me knowing that little bit of a story in my head when i hear someone's lost somebody i know it's real change for them you know thank you for so sharing. thank you for sharing and yeah no problem it's I, I think it's useful to share and i think you know, it's it's I think that's the other thing that people don't do enough of. Um, I mean, I'm. I'm lucky that, you know, all the family are OK. So for now, but you never know, it could change in a heartbeat. And I think I've learned enough since that 25 year old that was couldn't deal with it and really struggled to deal with that grief, you know, I'm in a different place. It doesn't mean that grief won't, you know, a loss won't affect me. But I have learned different things about, you know, I've learned that we're in this physical body and there is an energy that is us, that is the host of that physical body. And that energy never dies. You know, 
the the body, the physical material, the soup that we walk around in of bones and blood and whatever, that that dies, but the energy never dies. And and the memories never die. You know, those people are always in our hearts, always in our memories. They truly don't ever die. Um, you know, it's not as final as people think it is. I agree. Yes, you can't hug that person. You can't speak to them. But how many times do we say, as you've said today, my mother was speaking to me, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and we oh, don't be silly. You didn't hear a voice. Yes, I did <laughs> hear a voice, you know, yeah. and you go, well, how the hell does that happen? <laughs> and, you know, OK, we're on a bit of a kind of a businessy podcast, but actually people need to know that need to learn this for themselves too. you know, we're, we're no different. We all have the same story. We all have the same experiences. Yes. People, times, places, events are all different. But essentially, it's the same journey, you know, and the same challenges, too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's why that's why I talked about that idea of the coaching, like the lifespan. We all have that birth. We need we need someone to support us when a baby is born, a newborn. Right. Then we have that. Uh, parenting piece we all need a little bit of support with the parenting during those years then we yes. have college because in career look how many times we're in the wrong or you know or just someone who can say what do you really want to be doing so we have all these places where we just need some support and support yeah. comes in different shapes and sizes so yeah wow arty um so how can people learn more about what you do get in touch with you you know, learn more about any courses or any support from you and your partner? Um, yes, for sure. So um, it is called the, the Holistic Life Care, D-I-Y-A Holistic Life Care. And um, our website is www.theoholisticlifecare.org. And um, yeah, everything's on there, points of contact. Um and I, yeah, if you Google my name, you'll find something that I've done somewhere. <laughs> so that's another some beautifully one. written book. Oh, or, yeah. Or contribution. It is on the Amazon, the, the authorship book. Um, we all, it was a great experience. We got to share stories like our own personal stories, like we get to do with you, Michael, just in written form. Great. What's the name of the title of the book? Oh, it's called Dare to Be, um, Dare to Be Authentic. And it was volume six, finding your purpose. So of course my purpose came through losing my mom and it all coming together. What my purpose is, is yeah. to serve through, is to serve. What was your mom's name or what is your mom's name? I should uh, say. My mom's name. So it's others, but like people who didn't know how to pronounce it. So she would tell my name's Addie and her nickname was Arun for our family members. Arun. Mm-hmm. Lovely. Well, thank you, Mum, for sending Artie to my podcast. I appreciate oh, it. Thank you. And thank you. Yes. Was there anything else that I didn't ask that you would have liked to have mentioned at all? Well, Michael, not a not a question. I just want to share that we all have, I said it earlier in the beginning, we all have stories. We're tied together by stories. My story has no bigger value than yours, or we don't need to compare. Stories aren't compare. They don't need to be comparative. No. They're narratives. They're narratives. So really sit with somebody and hear their story and realize how much you hold in common with them or, you know, or just reflect how it is crazy as this life is that it is ups and downs, but it is a gift. And we were chosen on the hierarchy to be human. So obviously you know the tatum pole of all of our beautiful pieces of nature then we need to be a little bit more respectful for it being a gift yes to uh, be patient and show some self-compassion on our journey and our narrative oh, i love that i love that thank you for sharing it that message that's brilliant 
And you're hundred percent right because I've interviewed probably uh, over 160 individuals uh, since I started this journey on podcasting and they're all sharing their story. And in every single one, there is something that ties us together. Like we have something in common or we have had a similar experience or it never fails. It doesn't amaze me anymore. I'm going to go, yeah, that's about right. Here's another person, lovely person who I'm sharing an interview with and we have things in common. And I think it's the world over, right? <laughs> it just proves that it could be 160 people. It could be 1.6 million people. It could be a billion people. Um, we're all, we're just all the same. Yes. Yes. Which makes us part of that human, I mean, the, the animal kingdom, a million kingdom, right? To know that there are some things we share and we need yeah. to get back to that, to, to realize it's about connection and connection coming through stories and being together and being one with yourself too, finding that relationship with yourself, which is extremely, extremely important. Thank you, Artie, for being on the podcast. Uh, it's been Thank you, Michael. really amazing speaking to you. You as well. And I look forward to seeing how your journey develops. What Did you say you're still working on the education and university piece? Yes, yes. I'm in my second year in my program. So I have, a couple, I have more, some more years to go. I wish you massive success with that. Yeah. I'm sure it's going to be wonderful and another stage in your journey. Amazing. Take care. Bye for now. See you. Take care. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.